In this lecture in Climate and Earth 401, we're going to start to talk about scale analysis. In this first lecture on scale analysis, the idea of a time scale. A time scale is the characteristic amount of time for something to occur. We're going to be using this idea in scale analysis where we are going to consider both time and space and the scale at which dynamical features take place. We will then want to compare things. Are they fast? Are they slow? Are they large? Or are they small? This idea of comparison and comparing one feature to another is essential to scale analysis because you're always going to be considering scale analysis when you're comparing two features and trying to isolate one feature relative to the other so that you can study it in some detail. The purpose of scale analysis is that ability to isolate features and study them in detail. It is the ability to filter the equations so that motions that might not be important to your problem are not actually supported within the equations. And it is a way to simplify the equations. Without scale analysis, it's very difficult to take on the full equations of motion and solve them. We saw in earlier lectures the importance of the Earth's rotation to motions on the planet. Hence, a natural time scale for considering meteorological and oceanographic dynamics is the time scale of the Earth's rotation. To look at that, we want to look at the angular velocity of the Earth. And the Earth's surface moves through the circumference at some latitude in 24 hours. Hence, 24 hours is a natural time scale to study meteorological features. Earlier in the course, we introduced the idea of rotating coordinate systems, and in particular, a tangential Cartesian coordinate system rotating on the surface of the Earth. We are interested in the rotation of an xy plane around a z-axis, and that z-axis is going to be our local vertical at whatever latitude we are on on the surface. Here's a slightly more realistic picture of that situation where we have the Earth rotating with angular velocity omega around its axis. The z-axis here, the axis of rotation, is the polar line running from the north to the south pole. We take that vector, we place it at the latitude in which we are observing or, or the latitude at which we are studying a phenomenon. We then take that vector and look at its components in the local vertical and in the local horizontal. You should recognize this as the same way that we treated angular momentum. You should recognize this as the way that we got to the Coriolis parameter. If you consider the rotation as a function of latitude, the rotation is fastest up here at the pole, and it is zero at the equator, where there is no rotation around the local vertical. We are interested in the component of the angular velocity in the local vertical. With that consideration, a natural time scale is the Coriolis parameter f, which is equal to 2 omega sine of the latitude. And at 45 degrees latitude, f is often assumed to be a constant, and that constant is approximately 10 to the minus 4 seconds to the minus 1. That is, 10 to the minus 4 over seconds. This is a characteristic time scale for rotation. I want to think about this a little bit in terms of objects moving through the atmosphere. It's given that the rotation of the Earth is important to our perception of motion, we will consider an airplane and a baseball. Considering the airplane, we'll take a problem such as how far is it from Denver to Detroit? How fast does a plane fly? How long does it take to make that trip? And then, how do I compare this with the rotation of the Earth? In an order of magnitude argument, it's about a thousand miles from Denver to Detroit. How fast does a plane fly? Something like 500 miles per hour. Therefore, it takes about two hours to get from Denver to Detroit. 
how do I compare this with the rotation of the Earth? There is some combination of variables here above that we're going to use to get a time scale to compare to F0. If that time scale that we derive is approximately the same size as the Earth's rotation, then rotation might be important to analyzing the motion. If the Earth's rotation is fast compared to the time scale that we derive, then Earth's rotation is very important. If the Earth's rotation is very slow compared to the time scale of flying from Denver to Detroit, then we can say that rotation is not important to the problem. So the question comes, does the airplane pilot, does the navigator have to worry about the rotation of the Earth? The answer is yes. If they do not end that problem, then they will land in the wrong place. Does the baseball pitcher need to worry about the rotation of the Earth? If not, then why does the ball curve? Short answer is, the baseball player does not need to worry about the rotation of the Earth, and the curve perceived in the pitch is related to other dynamical factors governing the motion of the baseball. A problem that often interests people is the rotation of water as it goes down the drain of a bath or a sink. Is this caused by the rotation of the Earth? Is this a function of the Coriolis term? There is a discussion of this in one of the ancillary pieces of material that I have documented with the lecture on the Coriolis force, if you want to go back and look at that. The time scale that we're going to derive in general from problems with motion is going to be u over l, where u is a characteristic velocity. In the case of the airplane, that velocity was 500 miles per hour, and l is the characteristic length scale. For that problem, l was 1,000 miles, u was 500 miles per hour, hence u over l is going to be something like 1 over 2, but you got to get your units correct, and that's going to be per hours, so you need to turn it into per seconds and compare that with f naught. If something is moving fast, then u over l is large. If u over l is large relative to f, then rotation is not very important. If something is slow, then u over l is small, and the rotation might be very important. But it is the comparison of u over l to f naught which is going to let us make that determination. If we take f naught as approximately u over l and divide both sides by our f naught, we get this ratio that is equal to u, the characteristic velocity, over f naught times l. This is a dimensionless number, has no dimensions. And this particular ratio is given a name, and it's called the Rosby number. In fluid dynamics, there are many numbers like this, which are characteristic numbers, such as the Rosby number, which is how we evaluate whether or not rotation is important. Another number is the Reynolds number, which is how we evaluate whether or not viscosity is important. And then we have many other numbers, such as the Froude number, which is one that occasionally you see in atmospheric science. The basic algorithm is you take a ratio like this, you compare it to one. If it's much less than one, if it's much greater than one, then we might be able to say that we have, in this case, a rotational or a non-rotational flow. If the Rosby number is comparable to or smaller than one, then rotation is important, and we often say then that the flow is large scale, and that is because of this L here, which is a length scale. So what is important is how far does a parcel perhaps move relative to this length scale compared to how far does the Earth rotate during the time of that motion. But you can see if the number is going to be smaller than 1, then L here in general will be large. Hence, this is the reason we call this large scale. Typical numbers. 
In the atmosphere, a typical velocity above the ground might be something like 20 meters per second. The distance from the peak to a trough of a mid-latitude wave might be on the order of 1,000 kilometers. The angular velocity, omega, is 7.3 times 10 to the minus 5 per second. If we were to look at a problem in the Gulf Stream in the ocean, a representative velocity might be 100 centimeters per second. So you could ask, what is the length scale that would mean that the rotation is important? If we go back to our example of the baseball pitcher, a baseball pitcher will throw the ball about 90 feet at 90 miles per hour. Is rotation important? Going back to the problem that we mentioned earlier of the airplane and the baseball, you can calculate that U over L and compare it to F naught. For our atmospheric example, we have on the order of 1 over 7, and that's a small number, and hence for large-scale dynamics we would say that rotation is important. For the oceanic example that's posed here, we would say what is the length scale that gives us a Rossby number that is approximately 1. We need to remember that velocity and distance tell us something about time. This is one of the equations that, at least when I took science in school, was one of the first equations that you ever used, which was distance equals rate times time. We use this all the time when we think about how long is it going to take us to drive from one place to the other. You estimate time as distance divided by some average rate. You take this rate and you divide both sides of the equation by that rate. You choose some characteristic distance, L, and you have some characteristic speed, which is the magnitude of the velocity, which is U. Hence, the characteristic time is going to be defined as the characteristic distance divided by the characteristic speed and you will learn to recognize that as something that is representative of the acceleration or the d by dt operator so that the d by dt, the characteristic time for motion, is going to be u, this characteristic speed, over l, the characteristic velocity. And it's going to have units of 1 over second, just like the Coriolis term. The takeaway from this lecture is that the characteristic time scale for the time derivative for the acceleration will be u over l, and that is a number that will be compared to the Coriolis term f naught to determine whether or not rotation is important to a flow. And that is the end of the introduction to the concept of the time scale.